How do we cope with the prospect of our own deaths? Uh, How do we cope with the prospect of someone we love dying? Uh, The Apostle Paul is on a roll in respect of topics we don't talk about. Uh, Last week he talked about uh, sex. Uh, and if you weren't here last week, I think that uh, that, that sermon is on the internet. Uh, the teaching of the Apostle Paul, you won't get outside of the Bible. So if you weren't here last week, that is worth uh, listening to to see what he has to say. Uh, this week he talks about that other tricky to- topic. He talks about uh, death. Uh, Paul is writing to Christians in the Greek city of Thessalonica. Uh, and the specific issue he addresses is, is what happens to Christian believers when they die? Uh, he says to us, uh, chapter 4, verse 13, uh, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Uh, Death has always been a hard subject, uh, and just as today we use euphemisms, we use little phrases rather than mentioning that word death, uh, so we say someone has departed, uh, someone has passed away, someone has gone to be with their maker. Uh, So in the ancient world, they had little expression, uh, they simply used the word sleep instead of death. So we can imagine the Thessalonian Christians saying to Paul, uh, what about Christians who have fallen asleep? And he wasn't talking about 11 o'clock during the sermon. He was talking about about what happens when we die. And Paul says, uh, yes, uh, you need to know about this. Uh, Verse 13, you need to know about this so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Uh, please say, please note that he doesn't say so that you do not grieve. We do grieve, don't we? We do grieve when a Christian we love dies, just as Jesus grieved and wept at the tomb of Lazarus, his friend. Verse 13, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Uh, The rest of mankind, who is Paul talking about? Well, he's talking about people who do not know God, people who have no hope, no certainty concerning the future. Uh, I guess many of us have attended funerals where those that mourn have no real conviction that there is life after death. Uh, And those are often harrowing and distressing occasions. They are literally hopeless. Why do we not grieve like this? Verse 14, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Jesus died died and rose again. That is that is the very centre of Christianity, isn't it? Uh, If that didn't happen then Christianity is a hoax. Uh, If that didn't happen, then Jesus was wrong in his teaching. Uh, The apostles were wrong in their teaching. If Jesus did not die and physically rise, then we might as well go home because the Bible is a lie. Christianity is a lie. Uh, But those of us who are Christians have concluded that he did die and rise. But why did Jesus coming alive again, why does that mean that I can? Let's say you go to uh, Australia. Let's say you go on holiday. Let's say you do things in Australia uh, that you that Australians do. You know, you go to the Sydney Opera House. You see the Great Barrier uh, Reef. Uh, you do what Australians do. You call all the women Sheilas. Uh, you do Christmas Day on Bondi Beach. 
But then you come home and, and, and you say to me, you say, uh, I went to Australia. So that means you're going to Australia. There's no logic there, is there? Just because you've gone to Australia doesn't mean I'm going to Australia. And can you see the point? Just because Jesus rose from the dead doesn't automatically mean that everyone will rise from the dead, does it? So the question is, why does Jesus rising from the dead prove that Christians will rise from the dead? That's a question we need to get our minds around, isn't it? Why does Jesus rising from the dead prove that all Christians will rise from the dead? Uh, And the clue is in the last two words of verse 14. Uh, Paul writes, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Those two little words, in him, those who have fallen asleep in him, those who have died as Christians. Uh, Let's just quickly remind ourselves what a Christian is. Uh, A Christian is not someone who comes to church, although Christians do come to church. Uh, A Christian is not someone who is especially nice, although some Christians are especially nice. Uh, A Christian is not someone who has has been born in a Christian family. I wasn't born in a Christian family. No, a Christian is someone who recognises that Jesus is God's king. A Christian is someone who has realised that they have been doing life fundamentally wrong, that by and large they have been ignoring Jesus, they are out of relationship with Jesus. And so a Christian is someone who is crying to God for mercy and who is determined to make Jesus their king. That is a Christian, isn't it? And what happens when I become a Christian? What significant two things does Jesus promise to give us? Well, he promises two things. He promises to forgive me so that I can have a relationship with him. And some of us are learning in our Lent course that forgiveness is the key to restoring relationship. So he gives me forgiveness so I can have relationship. Uh, And secondly, his second gift, as part of that relationship, he gifts me his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit comes and lives within me. Can I explain that? No, I can't. That is, that is supernatural. Now, what does the Holy Spirit do? And crucially, what does the Holy Spirit do when I die? Would you turn back in your Bibles, please keep your fingers in 1 Thessalonian, but would you turn back to Romans chapter 8, and that is page, just excuse me a second, I've dropped my glasses on the floor. Uh, That is page 1134, Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. So keep your fingers in 1 Thessalonians, Romans chapter 8 verse uh, 11. Uh, Sarah will tell you that I'm still a little boy at heart. Uh, every, t- every now and then I will find, uh, uh, I'll discover something new and then I will be captivated by it. Uh, she knows that if she buys me a toy for Christmas, I will play with it for hours and it will fascinate me. Uh, Mike Jones was at our house last week. He spotted my radio-controlled Meccano car on the, and he was captivated with it too. Uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, I came across this verse this week, uh, and this verse has captivated me even more than Meccano. Why has it captivated me? Because Romans 8 verse 11 has shown me clearly the link between Jesus' resurrection and my certain resurrection. I think this is a great verse. Romans chapter 8 verse 11, Paul says... And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Can you see that link? Uh, It was the Holy Spirit who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. 
And if the Holy Spirit lives within me because I have chosen to become a Christian, Paul tells us that same Holy Spirit will also give life to my mortal body. And so my body will no longer be mortal, my body will become immortal. Isn't that stupendous? Uh, uh, DIY, I am no good at, uh, I'm no good at DIY. Uh, Deb's brother, Mark, um, I've seen him fix many problems in some of your houses. I've seen him fix uh, many problems in our church. The other uh, week, the front door of my house jammed. Uh, I telephoned Deb. Some hours later, the doorbell rang and Mark appeared with his uh, bag of big tools. And he came into my house to solve my problem just as Mark has been into some of your houses, into our church, to solve your problem. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit stepped into the life of the Lord Jesus to solve his problem. What was his problem? He was dead. The Holy Spirit steps into my life to solve my huge, huge problem, which is called death. Jesus rose because of the Spirit. When I become a follower of Jesus, I receive that same Spirit. Therefore, I can be confident every Christian will rise. Verse 15. Uh, Sorry, back to 1 Thessalonians. Verse 15. uh, According to the Lord's word... Uh, There are all sorts of views about death uh, around us. Uh, I remember visiting a a family a few years ago in order to uh, plan a a funeral. Uh, Quite a few family members were there. uh, And in the middle of the uh, the floor on on the carpet, there was little Tommy uh, playing with his, playing with his toys. And I think it was Granny or Mummy or someone like that uh, said to me, uh, we've told Tommy that Grandad is a star in the sky looking down on us. Isn't that right, Vicar? And of course that isn't right at all. How do we know what is right? How can we be sure what is right? Because God has very kindly revealed it to the Bible writers. Uh, Paul Paul here, he's not playing around with people. This isn't wishful thinking. This isn't isn't warm platitudes to make us feel better. Paul is encouraging us with cast iron truths that have been revealed to him for us by the author and ruler of the universe. Again, please, would you look at verse 14? Uh, And indeed, again, I just want to highlight two words. Uh, And they're the words, with Jesus. Verse 13, uh, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that Jesus, sorry, I beg your pardon. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Where today is the Christian who has died? He's not playing harps with the angels. She is not around us in a sort of mystical way. She is not looking down on us. And actually, as an aside, we wouldn't want that, would we? We wouldn't want people that we love looking down at us, seeing the messes we get ourselves into, being concerned about the mess we get ourselves into. Where today is the Christian who has died, that person is with Jesus. Now verse 15 uh, deals with a particular question that the Thessalonians had. Uh, Verse 15, uh, Paul says, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive 
who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Uh, and there was, some, there was perhaps some confusion in the mind of the Thessalonians uh, concerning exactly the order of events that would occur. So, you know, what actually is the order of, of, of when we die and when the second coming happens uh, and when we get new bodies that won't wear out? Uh, The Thessalonians had heard about the second coming. Uh, They'd heard that Jesus is coming back at the present, at the end of this present age to finally bring in the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, And their question was, well, hang on, those Christians who've already died, are they going to miss out? So the second coming is going to be the most spectacular, amazing thing which those who are alive at the time of the second coming will see firsthand. And so their question is, well, hang on, those who died last week or last year, are they going to miss out on that? Now, I confess that question has not particularly ever occurred to me, but nevertheless, it had occurred to the Thessalonians. But Paul's answer is still of interest to us because it tells us some of the things that will happen to us and to our Christian friends when we die. Verse 16, what does Paul tell us? He says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. As some of you know, last year I uh, was at a service at Westminster Abbey at which Her Majesty the Queen uh, was present, and it was spectacular. Uh, If I'm honest, it was much, much, much more spectacular than I was expecting it to be. It was phenomenal. Uh, the, 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 the The Queen arrived, and there was this perfect trumpet fanfare from the household cavalry. Uh, And those guys, they were dressed in their gold dress uniform and no one was in any doubt at all the Queen herself had arrived. But spectacular as that was, that is nothing on the future event that Paul describes here. Uh, Verse 16, the Lord himself, Uh, I've put the reference on the pew sheet, do look later, this is the one whom John in the book of Revelation describes as clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest, the hairs of his head as white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes like a flame of fire. His feet like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice like the roar of many waters. Sometime in the future, Paul is telling us, for the first time since AD 33, the risen, exalted Lord Jesus Christ will come to earth. And it will be extraordinary. Verse 16, again, with a loud command. Uh, The cry of the sergeant major on the parade ground will have nothing on this. No one will doubt who is in charge. Again, verse 16, with the voice of an archangel, uh, yes, there are others in God's creation that we will one day see and hear clearly. Verse 16, and with the trumpet call of God. Just as you remember in the Old Testament, those people who were in exile, they returned to Jerusalem and the trumpet announced their return home. So this trumpet call will signal our being taken home. Verse 16, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17, after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Picture language. Of course this is picture language. We will meet the Lord Jesus First of all, those Christians who have died in the past, uh, followed, Paul writes elsewhere, in the twinkling of an eye, in other words, instantaneously, 
by those of us who are still alive when he comes. And Paul tells us that our physical bodies will be transformed and we will become part of the new creation. Uh, And and in that new creation, what is the new creation going to be like? Uh, In that new creation, uh, forgive this, this came from a children's Bible, but I think it's so wonderful. In that new creation, there will be no more hankies. There will be no more hospitals. There will be no more hearses. Isn't that good? The Lord will meet us and we will always be with him. Paul's final words in chapter 4. These are the words maybe we could take home with us today, those final words in chapter 4, verse 18. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Uh, Please note, Paul doesn't say, be encouraged by these words. He doesn't say that. He says, encourage one another with these words. And so I take it that means that when a Christian brother or sister says to us, I've just learnt that I don't have long to live, or when a Christian brother or sister says to us, you may have heard I've just lost my husband or my wife or my, or my child or... Uh, I take it that when we hear hear words like that, uh, verse 18 means that we have a job to do when we hear words like that, doesn't it? Because we have such an encouraging message for each other in those circumstances, don't we? If you come to me and say, it looks like I only have weeks to live... Having read chapter 4, I can now say to you, can't I? I can say to you, brother, sister, believe the Bible, believe Jesus. This is not the beginning of the end. It's merely the end of the beginning. Is that not a message to encourage? Having read 1 Thessalonians 4, I can say to you, brother, sister, you're on your way home. You're on the way to glory. Can't I? What do I say to dying people when I have the opportunity? I tell them about heaven. And if they're not yet Christians, I tell them how they can put their trust in Jesus. We have such an encouraging message, don't we? But what of us when we lose someone? What can you say to me when I lose someone? What will you say to me when I lose someone? Will I need encouraging when I lose someone? I think I will. What might you say to me? Uh, When you find me in the pits of despair, will you find me in the pits of despair? Maybe. What will you say to me to encourage me? If, if, If when Sarah or one of our children, or one of my close Christian friends dies, how might you encourage me? Maybe you could say something to me based on this chapter. Maybe you could write me a card. Maybe you could write me a letter. Maybe, maybe you could write me a letter like this. Dear Sean, I mourn with you over your loss. We grieve. But we do not grieve like the rest of mankind, those that don't have the hope we have. Sean, you well know that Jesus rose from the dead. And because the person you loved knew and loved him, they are safe. Their imperfections are fully covered by Christ's death and their inheritance, which has always been secure, is now fully theirs. Sean, it is with tears 
that I rejoice with you that their job is done. The Bible makes us certain that one day believers will together be with the Lord Jesus. How would I feel to receive such a letter? How would you feel to receive such a letter? The Apostle Paul thinks we would be greatly encouraged. Our society doesn't talk about death, does it? Our society talks about everything except death. And I guess mainly our society doesn't talk about death because it sees death as being hopeless. Literally hopeless. The Bible does talk about death. The Bible talks about death lots. And for those who are in Christ, the Bible talks about death in warm and thrilling language. Because for the Christian, death, in a very real sense, is the climax of our life, isn't it? It's the gateway to us being with the Lord Jesus in paradise for always. Verse 18 is a command. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Our society is silent about death. We are not to be. We have the words of life that can enable people to themselves know Christ. We have the certainty that allows us not to grieve as others do. And we have the words with which to encourage and to support one another.